Welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, I'm just posting a link in the chat. And once you click on that, you're gonna see one thing that I'm showing you. And it would be great if you could um, follow these steps in the very beginning before we get started so that you're all set up once Tanya takes over and dives into the plot nine, um, the love story with plot nine, so to say. Okay, so once you hit, or once you click the link, you're gonna see this um, repository. And in the repository, if you scroll down a bit, there's a Google Collab Starter link. And if you click on it, there's obviously a Google Collab opening. And let's see, you scroll down a bit. And just to be on the safe side, the very first code chunk, it's called install packages, just hit run and let pip install like all the packages that you need and then once this is done hit the other play button below to load all the libraries that you need for for this meeting in case you don't want to use google collab there's like as you can see it takes some time like about two minutes um if you don't want to use google collab there's another option you can also use the code it's all in the repository here just go like either like download the entire zip file clone the repository or download like the single files we do have a starter notebook where like the, it's kind of a blank slate uh, state if you want and we do have the solutions notebook where you find all the solutions for you to kind of look up in case you get lost but that's like for the very beginning, I'm going to post the link again in case someone missed it. It's basically bit, bit.ly slash ws minus plot nine. So workshop plot nine. Um, so that you can find that. And now without any further ado, we'll dive right into our meeting and we're super excited to have you all on board because it's actually the second round of our meeting that we joined where we joined forces like with pi ladies and our ladies and try to bring like the beauty of these two worlds to you let me share the screen again so here we go before we get started like just some few words about pi ladies and our ladies so that you know where you ended up like today at 6 p.m cst time um or whatever time it is at your place so Pi Ladies and Our Ladies are part of two global communities, like Pi Ladies and Our Ladies. And these communities have the goal to empower women and to promote gender diversity in the coding world, may it be R or Python or like as we do both, basically. And if you want to get involved um, in any of the chapters, like you're always free to reach out to like either us or other chapters. We're a super welcoming and open community. Um, who are always looking for more inspiration and new people. Um, just a few words, like who are we, so to say. So um, we're four chapters, Pi Ladies Munich, Pi Ladies Tunis, Our Ladies Paris, and Our Ladies Cologne. And we got like we were funded like at the like five up to five years ago, so to say. Um, and we we're organized by Laisa Uchoa, she's from Munich, Amal Tilly, she and Hedia Tani. They're from Tunis. Um, and then it's Muna, she's from Paris, and it's Gabe, and it's me, and we're organizing Our Ladies Cologne. So, as I said before, if you're up for getting involved, if you want to present at a future meeting, if you want to co organize stuff, just feel free to reach out. And without any further ado, we're going to hand over to the fantastic data list queen, Tanya who does so many beautiful and cool plots. And if you want to know more about her, you can just look her up on Twitter. She's posting so many cool visualizations and we're super excited to learn more about the plot nine concept in Python that is actually based on the, like at least based on my knowledge, but Tanya might know better and tell us more about that in a second, which is based on the logic of ggplot, a super famous visualization package in R. Thank you, Cosima. That was can no, you hear me? Just, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I was okay. just wanted to un unshare the screen and it didn't work at the first attempt. No, now it's your turn. 
Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, no pressure with a, with a title like Data Queen, but I hope that today there is something for everyone today. Uh, very excited for our ladies and Pi ladies to join forces and invite me uh, to go through ggplot and plot nine concepts today. Uh, I would describe myself as a data geek. I do tons of different data things. My background is actually in RStats. I, I started coding off in RStats. I don't even have a traditional computer science degree background. So I, I very much believe that anybody can pick up coding so long as you're motivated. Uh, and I hope that even if you're, if you're not coming from a traditional computer science background that you, you can fall in love with coding just like I did. Um, without further ado, let's kind of jump into it. I promise it's very slide light. I don't like doing a lot of slides and we'll get right into the coding notebooks afterwards. So if you're not a comic book fan, don't worry. I'm not gonna dive deep into comic book references. Uh, but I wanna acknowledge that there is all types of folks on this call today, whether you're coming from a Python background or an R background, I like to think of it like comics. You're all superheroes. You're all awesome. You're doing different data things on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's cleaning up bad data, uh, creating cool data viz, building data models. You all have superpowers. Uh, and you're all using them in different ways, just with different tools. And the special thing about today's workshop is that it's like the crossover episode I never got with these uh, superhero fans. So it's a perfect way to combine both worlds with Plot9, because as Cosima mentioned, Plot9 is based off of a package in R called ggplot. In fact, today you'll probably hear me use those terms interchangeably. I might call it ggplot or Plot9. But for today's session, all you need to know is it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, if you are a Marvel DC fan, you might understand this reference. All you need to know is that this actor played a role both in the DC and Marvel universe for movies. That's just my, my nerd side showing a little bit. All right, before we get right into the coding section, I just wanna go over some quick ggplot concepts. So if you've never seen ggplot before, there's a quick overview of, of what it consists of. So I like to think of it a little bit like cake. Uh, why cake? Because cake has different layers. And with ggplot, it has a similar concept where you can continue to build on your plot by using different layers. And we call those layers geoms. Uh, furthermore, with ggplot, you also have a specific map mapping function called AES. Just think of it as a way to kind of uh, determine and specify what ingredients you're using for your plot. So your ingredients would be like your data variables in your data frame. So you're just mapping, for instance, what is X equal to, Y equal to, uh, when it gets to cut other arguments like fills, shapes, we can also use that mapping just to, just to outline what we're calling in our data frame. Uh, there's a couple of other things, scales, if we wanna use some tweaks, either for X axis, Y axis, and other, um, other guides. And then my favorite part, which is like the styling and decor of the plot, uh, we can do this with ggplot theme. If you're not crazy about doing custom themes, that's perfectly okay. There's actually some out of the box themes that you can use. Uh, they're available on Plot9's API documentation, which I have a link to, so don't worry about Googling anything off the, off the cuff. Uh, but to get the most out of our time today, I thought it would be a lot of fun to dive into building our custom themes together. All right, I promise short slides, that's it. We're gonna now toggle over to our coding notebooks. Um, I'm gonna try to, oh, there's my photo booth screen. Let's do, open this in Google Colab. So I'm gonna do this from scratch with everyone. So if you're opening it up directly from your drive, so if you downloaded the file, the way that you could do this is you open up Google Colab and then you hit upload. As a side note for folks who are just joining, uh, keep in mind that we have wonderful moderators who are here to help you troubleshoot throughout the way. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function and one of them should help you uh, as, as we get set up. So go ahead and choose the file. So if you've downloaded it to your desktop or if it's in your downloads directory, you can open it up right here. We do have a starter notebook available and the solutions notebook. So if you're telling me, Tanya, it's happy hour, I can't hold my cocktail and code at the same time, no worries, you can kick back, it can be very passive and you can just have the solutions notebook and follow along. 
if you want to be more active and put the work in workshop, we have a starter notebook where we've actually removed some of the code chunks and we'll be coding along together step by step. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the starter notebook. All right. Let's open that up. I just want to get a quick thumbs up from my camera people. Can you see my screen? Great. Awesome. Okay. So main thing about this workshop, it's broken up into five parts. First one is just going to be a quick setup of your packages and libraries. Uh, we're going to download a couple of supporting font packages. Next step, we're going to do some quick data prep. It's not going to be data prep heavy, um, but we will walk through a quick, uh, quick way of how to manipulate data with pandas. And then we're going to get right into the plotting fun. So by the end of this workshop, you're going to be exploring three different plot types, a lot of different tips and tricks along the way. Uh, so hopefully there's something for everyone as we go through it. So if you haven't already, go ahead and run the install on these packages. If you have them installed, great. Uh, if you're not sure, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and run the code chunk anyways. It shouldn't have an effect. But go ahead and get that started for me because it might take about like two minutes while we get set up here. Uh, for people who are new, new to Jupyter Notebooks, you can either run the code with a nice play button here on the left-hand side. Uh, for Mac users, you can hit command enter, and I believe for Windows users, it's control enter, and that should be able to run the code for you. While that is installing, I'm going to give us a quick little overview of the data set that we're using today and talk a little bit about the libraries that we're going to be using. So the data set that we're using today comes from open source psychometrics project. Uh, if you're a fan of pop culture and psychology, this is going to be especially fun. Uh, essentially, what this project aimed to do was take a list of characters from different fictitious universes, uh, whether it's TV show characters from Friends or Westworld or comic book characters from Marvel. And then they had like a personality assessment score for each one where users were rating them and then they create composite averages. So for instance, it might say, how conservative is this character compared to this character? Um, how lazy or diligent is this character compared to another character? And there's about 400 different uh, survey questions for each character. The file is pretty large. I'm glad we're not working in Excel today because there's a 100% chance it would crash. Um, and as a side note, this data set was also submitted to Tidy Tuesday. For my R friends on the call, you might be familiar with Tidy Tuesday. It's brought to you by the wonderful R for Data Science Learning Community Online. And Tidy Tuesday, what they do is every week, they publish a different data set and invite people to explore it, share their data visualizations and their code. Uh, side note, it's actually how I got into data visualization because of this community. So for me, this is really near and dear to my heart. Okay, so while that's installing, quick overview of the packages that we're using today. Python folks will probably be familiar with the first two, pandas and numpy. That's like the generic import for every single data science Jupyter notebook out there. Uh, pandas, uh, for my R folks who are not familiar with Python, think of it a little bit like dplyr. We're gonna be using it to filter subset data. You can merge data. You can do a bunch of different like uh, mutations with, with pandas. Numpy, we're gonna use briefly to create a new column. Uh, all the plotting is gonna be done in plot nine, and then we're gonna be importing matplotlib to actually adjust some of the fonts. Fun fact, plot nine, the backbone of it is actually built off of matplotlib. So it's actually why font manager from matplotlib works nicely in conjunction with plot nine is that you can change those fonts. Speaking of fonts, since we're working in Colab and I have no idea what people's font libraries look like outside of this, we're gonna go ahead and download the fonts directly from Google's GitHub. Uh, shout out to Cosima for helping me with this part because I was very frustrated with the default fonts that were coming up from, from Matplotlib. Um, but there's this cool Stack Overflow post. There's no shame in using Stack Overflow to troubleshoot things. I've done it for, this, uh, for the sake of this workshop too with fonts, but go ahead and click run. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna uh, download the Chivo libraries directly um, to the, the, the Google Drive that we're working in. And then after that, 
we're just going to run this code chunk and it's going to add it with the font manager add font tool to, to run each one individually. So click run. Oh, great. Do as I say, not as I do. I did not import the libraries, right? Okay. Hopefully that worked. So now let's go back here and click run. It loops through and adds the libraries. All right, hopefully everybody has their libraries installed by this point. We're gonna go through some quick data prep um, for the sake of time, since I want us to get the most out of plot nine, I've left these code chunks filled in. So we're just gonna run them real quick. I'll give you a brief overview um, for our users who are using Python for the first time. There's a couple of notes in there for you to go back in and explore a couple of tricks with pandas. Uh, but the first thing that we're gonna do is just go ahead and import our data set. And in Python, the way that we store things is with an equal sign. So I know in R, sometimes it's it's like this. There's probably three different ways to do it, but all you need to know is that anytime we're using this, we're storing something to an object. So we're creating a data frame object, the CSV file, and then we're using df.head just to look at the first five records. So let's get familiar with the data set. Uh, the data set here, the first few records that we can see pertain to a character from friends. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Friends, but it's a TV show from back in the 90s. It was pretty popular. And Monica Geller uh, is, is one of the main characters. So just a quick note, not each row corresponds to a character, but it corresponds to a value tied to a personality trait. So for instance, you've got messy me, you have diligent lazy, on time tardy. There's about like 400 different ones, by the way, but we're not going to be looking at all, all of those. Um, other functions to explore our data frame, you can go ahead and run these all individually. I've commented them out, but feel free to explore that on your own time. Um, the one that we're going to just look at real quick is df.describe, which is going to give us some descriptive statistics about our numeric values. So I can see her average rating. I can see the minimum value is around 50 and the maximum value is around 100. Uh, I want to call this out because we're gonna be playing around with the average rating and standardizing it. Um, I'm changing this min value to zero in just a minute. All right, next step, cleaning and reshaping. I don't know how many people have the perfect data set out of the gate and they're just ready to plot. For me, that's not the case. You always have to spend at least 10 minutes or so massaging the data. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and run a couple of steps right here to do that for us to simplify the plotting down the road. So all I'm doing in this step is doing a subset of some of the questions. I've selected a few of them and created a list. Um, in Python, you can create list objects with brackets and delimit it with a comma and store all these values as string. All I'm doing here is saying subset the data so that the question pertains to one of this in the list. And then I'm subsetting the columns to only select those individual ones. So we don't need all of this detail of rating standard deviation and, and number ratings. We're just gonna be fo focusing on the average for today. All right, can go ahead and run. So now it's chopped off those col columns and I can see that it's pulling those questions that are part of my question data set, question list. All right, a couple more steps until we get into plotting. So going back to that descriptive uh, uh, statistics that we saw earlier, we noticed that average rating had a minimum value of 50 and a maximum value of 100. On the questionnaire, it's actually zero to 100, but the way that the data came in, I noticed a couple of incongruencies. So you'll notice here that Monica for messy neat is labeled as neat with a, a value rating of 95.7. We also have other characters like uh, Phoebe who are classified as messy with a rating of 79.1. What the folks did with this data set is that they flipped it. So anytime it it reached past the 50 value, they switched it so it's messy or neat. So what we're gonna do to standardize that is we're gonna say, we're gonna split this up 
and say, all right, let's split, split this up so it's now messy and neat. And if the personality type corresponds to the first value, keep the average rating. If it is opposite, like neat, we're gonna subtract it from 100. Because essentially what we wanna do is have it scaled zero to 100 so I can compare Monica to Phoebe and Joey all on the same scale. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and run this set of code. So this is gonna split it for people who are more comfortable with R. Uh, you could think of the equivalent here with dplyr separate, uh, it's a similar function that you would split your data. And then this, in this part, all we're doing is standardizing it by using np.where. Think of this like an if then or a case one function where we're doing something that says, all right, if the, if the first part of this question uh, is messy and it's equal to their personality type, keep the rating, otherwise do 100 minus the rating. I'm gonna go ahead and run that. Actually a, a more appropriate way to see if this, is, this has worked would be to do this. All right, so now I can see Monica's new rating score is 4.3 and it's keeping Rachel's at 69.8 because messy corresponds to this outcome. And now we've just essentially standardized our scales. All right, one last part. I know we're all itching to plot here, me too. Uh, the, the wrangling part is not my favorite, but it might be other people's favorite. Last thing that we're doing is we're gonna pivot our data set. So if you notice in the prior step, each row corresponds to a personality type, not a character. So we're going to pivot it to make our data set wider where we're now storing the rating values per personality as columns instead of rows. So we can use that, we can do that with pandas.pivot. I've got the functions written out here. You don't have to worry about uh, how to code it right now. We just have to run it in order to get to our next plotting step. Once you've run the code, the first three uh, records, you'll notice that now each row corresponds to just one character. And now we can see all of the personality ratings stored as independent column values. Okay, now for the fun, exciting part that we've all been waiting for with plot nine. So now that we have the data in the shape that we need, uh, let's jump right into it. So I've got a little bit of background on what plot nine is and how it came about. Um, I, I did start off with R and then eventually I picked up Python. And so when I learned about Python plot nine, I got really excited because I was like, there's, wait, there's ggplot for Python. You mean I can do ggplot things there with similar functions? And I, I was so over the moon about it because learning Python, I did have a little bit of struggle with matplotlib. Um, I did like Seaborn, I thought that was a little bit cooler. And then I thought, well, if I could do ggplot stuff in Python, I'm totally gonna check it out. And thanks to the developer, I'm gonna, I might butcher their name, uh, but I'm gonna attempt it, Hassan Kabirj, has an entire repo dedicated to building out Plot9. They've got great documentation with Plot9 API. Um, but if you're like me, I like learning through examples. So I think it's gonna be great today for us to walk through some examples of how those arguments look. Uh, for my R people joining us, uh, I would say you've got almost 90% of the same functionality that you do with ggplot. So they've done a really impressive job with translating all of this. Um, and they've used like matplotlib as the main backbone to building like the ggplot equivalent here in Python. Um, some of the building blocks. So if you remember our little cake graphic from earlier, uh, you've got ggplot, which is like the parent object. So every time we set up a ggplot object, it's always gonna start with ggplot. We're gonna map the data frame to it along with the different variables that we're using. We're gonna play around with different geom, geom layers. Um, so think of it like, different chart types. So if you're building a scatter plot, you're gonna use geom point. If you're building a bar plot, geom call. There's a ton of different geom functions. I have a link here in the notebook if you wanna explore other ones outside of this workshop. Um, other things, we're gonna do the mapping with the aesthetics. Scales, it's gonna help us with tweaking certain components of the plot. Labs is super, I think, straightforward. It's, it's an easy way to do all of your plot titling from the main title to your access labels. 
And then my favorite part is the themes. We're going to be doing some custom themes and, and working with ele uh, element components within themes today. Okay. All right. Now for some hands-on coding. Again, if you prefer to be a little more passive and enjoy happy hour in a different time zone, all power to you. You can come back and try coding this later. Uh, but for those who want to dabble in coding, let's go ahead and code our first ggplot together. So we're going to we're going to work with the, within the universe of those friends characters from the TV show. Um, the first code chunk is just subsetting that data to look only at friends characters based on this variable called uni name or universe name. And what I would like to explore is how messy are the characters from friends. Uh, I think an easy way to do comparisons would be with a bar plot. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up uh, a pair of parentheses. You're always going to wrap your ggplot object in a set of parentheses uh, when it comes to coding in Python. So you're going to start off with ggplot. If you're like me and struggle with keeping track of your parentheses, I always recommend doing an indentation to keep it on a separate line. Now the first argument within ggplot that we're gonna specify, not that there's any specific order, but I like to start with data. So what we're doing is we're saying our data uh, argument is going to map to our new friends data set that we've created. So we're gonna say is equal to friends. The next part is going to be setting up the mapping for our data frame. So you're gonna start with mapping is equal to and then we're going to use that aesthetic function. So do AES and then do a new set of brackets. And then AES has its own set of arguments. So here we're going to say X is equal to, for those who need a refresher on the data set. So I want to make sure that it's equal to my character name. So care underscore name. And then I'm going to plug in my Y values equal to messy. Now, quick note for, for our friends jumping into plot nine. Um, the only key difference here is that you're going to call your variable names as strings. So you're going to say string character name y is equal to messy. Now to keep building on ggplot and to keep adding, we're literally going to add with a plus sign. So that's how we keep everything together is using that plus sign. And then go to the next, just do a quick return or shift and then do GM call. And once you've plugged that all in, go ahead and run the code. All right, so this is the initial output and it's intentionally designed to not be attractive on the first go because we're starting off small, but don't worry, we're gonna get there. We're gonna slowly level up as we go through this. So the first thing you'll notice is that there's a little bit of overlap here with the names on our axis, our X axis. So there's two things we could do. We could either, decrease the font size of the axis label, or you could increase the plot size. Let's start off by increasing a plot size. So we're gonna keep adding to our ggplot. So go ahead and add the plus sign. And now we're gonna get a taste of themes. So within theme, there's an argument called figure size. And to pass in the width and height, we're gonna store it as a, as a list. So here I'm gonna set a list with my brackets, eight, comma six and go ahead and run that. So now it's increased the size of our plot. Great. Now it's more legible. I wouldn't say it's the best looking plot, but it's more legible. Now on to our second step of how, how to make it a little more attractive. So for those who aren't familiar with friends, I've added some pictures here. Um, I think the first thing that you'll notice is like Joey is the messiest of the group. Uh, this is Joey for anybody who hasn't met Joey yet. And Monica is definitely a neat freak. She's she's not, not that messy at all. You can see her hoovering her own vacuum cleaner here. That should tell you everything about Monica. Now there's a couple of things that we could do to make this a little bit more intuitive. Uh, the first thing is that ggplot will order the x-axis uh, if you're using like a discrete variable like name in al alphabetical order. order. What if we wanted to order it by ascending order or descending, des descending order? 
Well, we can do that by altering our mapping just a little bit. So we're gonna try out a trick in the next phase. Additionally, we might wanna make these values a little bit more explicit. So instead of kind of eyeballing what the rating is, let's go ahead and add some text above the bar charts uh, to make it a little more legible. We'll add some titles in, uh, and then we'll also try to get rid of this hideous gray and play around with some color options. All right, so let's level up our plot. So we're gonna start off the same way, so with your parentheses. And the first thing we're gonna do is ggplot. I think repetition is always great practice. So we're gonna do the same thing, data is equal to friends. And then say mapping, AES, just like last time. And X is equal to, and this is where it's gonna be a little bit different. So instead of just plugging in character name, because we wanna reorder it, there's a little trick that we can do where we're essentially creating a function within the string. And you can say reorder, and you're gonna say, I wanna reorder character name, comma, and this is gonna be by, so this is gonna be by your messy value. So reorder, parentheses, character name, comma, messy. The Y mapping is gonna stay the same. And let's go ahead and add back our geom call. All right. Let's just start here for a second. Go ahead and run the code. Oh, I should have added the theme here. So let's just go ahead and add the theme real quick. There's no shame in copy pasting either. If it's too much typing, feel free to copy the previous answer. Um, but let's go ahead and make this a little more legible. All right, it's better, right? Now I can kind of see the order of things and it's a, it's a little more appealing to look at. The con, now it's literally labeled my x-axis something different and it doesn't look too great there. So we're gonna go ahead and fix this by implementing labs. By the way, when it comes to building your ggplot, ggplot is always gonna be the first thing that you have. Um, the order of how you add things down here, as you build more complex plot, is adding ggplot and then having your geoms followed by your labs, followed by your theme. We're gonna go ahead and relabel things. Uh, the way that we can do this is by using labs in ggplot. Um, I think in matplotlib, like the thing that you'd have to do is do a new line for each one. You'd have to do like dot plot dot title, plot dot x axis uh, uh, title. My knowledge of matplotlib is fuzzy, so I'm not even gonna to pretend to go that deep into it. But you can use labs and then we can set all of our arguments here to change the labels of our plot so one argument that we'll pass through is title then you can pass through a string so we can say how messy are the characters from friends feel free to use a more inventive title um why let's call it the messy rating out of 100 or messiness and x um you can even leave it blank if you want. You don't have to spe specify character name, but my personal preference would be to leave this blank because it's pretty intuitive. All right, go ahead and run. I think there's a T missing, a title. Oh, you're right. It's funny that it's not friend, right? I, I would expect an error, but probably title is an argument that you can pass. Who knows? That's a good question. It's a good question. I'm glad your typing skills are, are better than mine. Um, yeah, it's the one I, I was just wondering. It's always like, easier. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So now we have the, the titles applied to our plot. Uh, I did promise a couple of other tricks in this step. Uh, one of the fun ones is, is probably going to be just changing the colors of this gray. So let's go ahead and get rid of this. Um, one thing that you can do within your function. So instead of just saying geom call, you could apply additional mappings to it uh, here instead of in the ggplot object. But if you wanna map to static values, you can also just pass in the arguments there without the AES function. So for here, we're gonna pass in an aesthetic variable called fill, which is gonna change the fill of our, our bar chart. And you can either pass in like a generic color label like blue or green, 
or you can even pass in a hex value. So let's try that. And that would change up the color of our chart. Additionally, if we wanna get those floating labels above the columns, this is where we're gonna work with layering geom. So I like to keep it kind of all together. So we're gonna, we're gonna go right after geom call. Keep in mind, there's a plus sign. Now we're gonna add a different layer called text or geom text. And just to get a flavor of how you can do mappings here, you can either set the mappings at the parent level or you can set them at the text level. We want to map it because we have to pass in a different argument of, of what are we labeling? What are we passing in as a label value? So label, and we want to pass in messy and we can keep it as is. Let's see how that looks. Okay. So notice that it intersects with your bar plot. We want it to hover just a little bit outside. The other thing we notice is that there's a lot of trailing values in, in the, with a the decimal here. So we might wanna clean that up. There's a couple of things that we can do. First thing, we're gonna override our Y mapping here in this geom. We're gonna pass in messy. And just like we can pass in like a function within the mapping, we can also like add or subtract values. So we could say messy plus three. So that's gonna bump it up a little bit above the chart. And I'll, I'll kind of give this as a note. Sometimes positional arguments like this are a little bit more art than science. There's a couple of times where I play around with it where, you know, plus five is the right one, plus one. Um, so a little bit of, sometimes it's a little bit of experimentation. And then if we want to round our values, we can pass in this round function. Let's say we just want uh, it going to the first decimal. All right, that looks a lot better, doesn't it? Okay. Last thing before we move on to the next step, well, a couple of things. I promised you different fonts. So this defaults to the Deja Vu uh, Sans font in Matplotlib. If you want to change the text throughout the plot, we can use theme. So we're gonna keep building on these arguments with uh, keep delimiting it with commas. So now, uh, after figure size, we're, we're gonna pass in an argument called text. Uh, and we can pass in another function. There's gonna be four different functions to tweak themes. We'll go a little bit more in depth in just a second. We use element text to modify. Um, you can modify the family, you can modify the weight or the, the face of the text. You can even modify the size and color. So here we're gonna set family is equal equal to Chivo. So all of those fonts that you imported earlier should work here. If it's spitting out an error because you've skipped that step, you can revisit it or you can just eliminate this argument altogether. And now it's gonna change the fonts. If you wanna get really granular, there's a variety of different text uh, objects within a plot that you can modify individually. So for instance, if we wanna bold the plot title, you could do the same thing here and say, uh, the weight of it is going to be bold. Uh, I said 90% is going to be the same from R. I think in R it's called face and not weight, but there's might be a couple of minor differences between the two. And let's increase the size a little bit. Awesome. And now we have a custom bar chart with uh, applied themes to change the fonts. You have different layers, and we, we played around with changing up the uh, plot titles. The next phase, if you want to like go one step further, I've got a couple of tricks here in this advanced bar plot. I've hidden it. So if you want to unhide or expand, you can click this arrow right here by advanced bar plot. And here's like a, a, an upgraded version of the chart. So go ahead and, and click run. By the way, I think it's good practice to store these ggplot objects in a variable. So like store it as final bar. This is going to be really helpful when you want to get to saving your plots, because I'm sure you might want to use them for presentations or something else. Um, and there's some code here of how you might do that if, you, if you're running this locally. Since we're running it in Google Colab, I'm not going to attempt to, to try to save it because I don't know where it's going to end up. Um, but go ahead and, and run the code chunk. 
uh, I'm a major fan of dark mode plots. So I, I thought this here has to be an opportunity for me to kind of try to do a dark mode plot here with all of you. Um, how you might do this, it's a lot of different, um, not, not too many, but a couple of tweaks in the theme. So the way that you can change the backgrounds, there's a couple of different arguments, panel background and plot background. You're gonna be using a function called element rect. Um, I have some notes here, by the way, on different theme objects and what they do. Here are the four main ones. So for components that deal with lines, um, specifically like your, your axis lines, your grid lines, you're always gonna be using element line. For any kind of text component, you'll be defaulting to element text function. For borders and backgrounds, you're gonna be using element rect. And then if you wanna remove objects, there's also a trick where you can use element blank to completely remove it. So like you don't want specific text values or grid lines, you can get rid of it with an element uh, blank. So here's a couple of tricks of how you might do that. So setting it to the fill to black on the, on the back end, um, changing the font color to white since we're, we're going dark mode. And then of course, the other big noticeable difference is that we've completely flipped this plot. You remember that we had it as a bar plot, now it's a horizontal bar plot. Um, personally, I think when you're dealing with long, like discrete variable names like this, it's a little more legible to have um, that stored as your Y instead of your X. So let's say you've gotten this far down in, in plot nine, you're like, shoot, it would look better if I could flip it. There's actually one line of code that makes this possible. I have it right here for reference. So you could do is you could plug in chord underscore flip, which is just going to reverse the mappings of X and Y. And plugging that in, it's just so easy. It's, an, it's a nice trick to just change the whole layout of the plot, um, but I, I thought it would be cool to add in. One other trick that I think is, is worth pointing out, sometimes it's really helpful to call out specific observations in your data visualization. Um, there's a nice way of doing that in ggplot with a function called annotate. Um, key difference between annotate and geom text. If you have like a one-off observation that you wanna call out and the text isn't in a data frame that you're mapping to, it's easier to use annotate. Um, but if like the text is in your data frame, you might wanna default to geom text. So here's a quick look at how annotate works. It's very similar to, um, doing some basic mappings within geoms. The key difference is that you don't have this AES wrapped around it. You can map it to static, um, static variables. So like the fill color, for instance, is black. For the background of this, we're setting it as a label. So there's a, you can either create a text or a label. Uh, text is just gonna be text. Label will have that nice border to it. So here you have the fill is, the, is black. Uh, the color of the text is white, and then you can specify the labels. Uh, for those who are familiar with HTML, if you wanna do like a line break, you can use this backslash N to wrap the text a little bit. And then you're gonna add in your positional arguments. So here I've got Y is equal to 36 and X is equal to 1.3. You might say, well, Tanya, you just mapped it to a discrete variable. How the heck is 1.3 working for your character names? How does it know? Uh, Quick trick here with annotations, it's just labeling it really one through six. So if you wanna add an annotation and plot it to a discrete variable, you can kind of eyeball it and say like, I want it to be somewhere between Monica and Ross. Monica is the equivalent of one, Ross is the equivalent of two. We're gonna set it to like 1.3. And that's the basic tricks for this elevated bar plot. Uh, I know we just went through a lot, so I'm, I'm going to pause here, give folks a minute to digest and open it up for Q&A. Oh, I'm all, sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just I want to thank you, Tanya, for your brilliant explanation. It was really clear. Uh, personally, it's really interesting to bring DigiPlot to Python. And I really liked uh, the part that you explained the black uh, background. <laughs> yeah. So here we have two questions uh, from Chris. He said, why 100 minus? I think for the rating, he mean that he need the, to, uh, to do 100 uh, minus rating when the outcome is uh, like one equal to personality. Yeah, great the first question. question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I can dive into it real quick. So for the for the sake of kind of creating a standardized scale, it was just a quick mm -hmm. way of flipping it. So the data set essentially like if it was 50.2 and messy, it would be like the opposite of saying like, um, I'm trying to do math here on the fly, 49.8 and neat, right? So it's just kind of the, the opposite value of it. So we just wanted to create a standardized scale to do the plotting um, before, before getting the plotting step. Good question. Yeah, and the second question from uh, Jipsha, sorry if I have pronounced uh, wrong your name, uh, he or she said, does giving variable names as strings make it uh, easier to create function if you want to build similar plots with different column names? Sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Uh, he or she said, uh, does uh, giving variable names as strings make it easier to create function if you want to build similar plots with different column names? Uh, I'm trying, I think I'm trying, tr trying to make sure yeah. I understand the question appropriately. Yeah, uh, I is this put it in the chat again. Yes. So, so in terms of like the variable names, um, you know, I always think it's, it's nice if it's more intuitive in your data frame, but sometimes if you've got like messy variable names in your data frame, that's when like I use labs to clean it up with different titles and different sections. Um, mm -hmm. I think I think it really depends on what I'm. Tr I'm trying to understand the question and interpret it fairly. I think I'm struggling on that part. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to the person who answered the uh, asked the question, but feel free to catch me offline too. And I'm I'm happy to run through it with you. Yeah, and the last question. He said, like the figure size between eight and six uh, is in which unit? Great question. I do not know. I do not have that answer. Um, I'm sure there's some documentation on, on what that is. Uh, I learned today, for instance, with saving it, you know, there, there might be some issues with resolution. I just want to call out this, especially with size. If you're increasing the size of your plot for exporting it, you might want to play around with a setting called DPI, which I believe stands for dots per image. I don't know if you've got resolution experts on the line, but if you increase that value, it's going to help with your resolution, especially if you're saving bigger files. Uh, there is another one to the string, I think, question. My hunch is that in R, you wouldn't put uh, reorder into the string. Maybe anxious if I remember what he said. There's probably, you know what, the beauty of ggplot is there's probably five different ways to do something. Uh, always go with like the method that's more intuitive for you. I'm just trying to show a couple of tricks that I've used in the past, but there's probably different ways of, of doing it as well. Totally fair. If I can chip in on that one, I think it's because like in R, you wouldn't like, if you, if you have this first line here that we are just seeing, if it's X equal reorder, char name, messy, and so on and so forth, in R, you wouldn't put the quotation marks around the reorder. That could be, right. because like, I'm also not 100% not sure what the question is aiming at, but that could be like the thing the person asks. And then that would it, be the answer. It, 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 is, it is a little, um, I will say coming over from R to Python and, and you know, for instance, adding, adding it within the string, it, it didn't make sense at first. But if you try doing this any other way, it's gonna it's gonna spit out an error. So keeping it all within a string is the only way that it it's worked for me. Um, unless they've made updates, you know, I, I could be wrong too. But this is this is just one way of doing it. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Awesome. Well, I hope I hope code is running for for folks. Uh, I know we're throwing a lot at you. Um, feel free to come back to this at a later date too. I always think practice makes almost perfect, but we're going to be running through a couple of different scenarios here. So there's, there's something for everyone. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to move on to the next section, which is dealing with scatter plots. Uh, for this, we're going to be leaving the universe of friends characters and we're going to be going over the world of Game of Thrones characters. Uh, I don't know if folks are familiar with the HBO show Game of Thrones. I know that there's a new spin-off series right now. My partner's yelling at me because I've never watched the spin-off series. So that's on my to-do list for this weekend for House of Dragons. But 
for, um, without deviating too much, we're gonna be exploring Game of Thrones characters with two different personality traits. Um, because I think scatter plots are a great way to compare two different types of continuous variables. And I think they come up a lot in like day to day data analysis. Okay, quick little setup in this code chunk here just to create another subset of our data set for Game of Thrones. Uh, we are just using characters for Game of Thrones here. We're also going to create a new variable called house. If you're familiar with the show, it's just like your main houses of like if they're part of the Stark house, Lannister house, Greyjoy. For those who are not familiar with the show, just think of it like families or allegiances that these characters are a part of. And then we're going to create one more uh, variable called first name. I know before running this that it's going to give me a panda set, set copy warning. I will admit pandas is not my like go-to library. There's probably a better way of manipulating this data, but for the purpose of today, it works. Uh, so go ahead and run that code chunk. Yeah, it can say use.loc earlier. I'm gonna have to bug someone from the PyLadies team of how to do this more efficiently later on. All right, so looking at our data set now, we have each row pertains to a specific character from Game of Thrones. So for instance, you've got Arya Stark, all of her personality traits, the house, which is the last name. Um, we also have a last name of N.A. if they, let me expand on this a little bit. I wanted to bring in more records to show it. I guess we don't have any N.A.s in the first one. Oh, yes, we do. So if they're, they're part of a house, it has the name of it. If it's not part of one of the main houses like Davos here, it has NAN, and then it also has the first name that we'll use uh, for labeling a little bit. All right, so for this scatter plot, let's go ahead and take a look at characters' um, personality ratings for the personality type of cunning and altruistic. So essentially like how honorable or cunning they are versus how selfish or selfless they are. So we're gonna wrap it again in parentheses. And we're going to start with ggplot. And this time, we're going to map data to our new data set, which is called GOT. Or GOT, but GOT for the show. And this time for mapping, plug in AES. For the X value, let's put in um, cunning. And for the Y value, let's plug in altruistic and let's actually add in one more one more mapping so we're expanding on this a little bit so here we can add in a fill color and instead of mapping it to a static value we could say all right i want to change the color of my dots to a specific discrete or continuous variable and you could do this here so here we're going to map it to a discrete variable house and then we're going to add and instead of geom call this time since we're doing a scatter plot we're going to use geom point go ahead and run that for me um just a second all right okay so first thing that we notice the dots are relatively small so we might want to increase the, the overall size of this so we can pass in a static mapping within geom point and change the size so let's set the size to five all right, so this is like your basic out of the box version of the scatter plot. So you've got the different dots, you've got the different colors based on house, you've got the legend here off to the side, but there's definitely a lot of opportunity for us to make this better. Let's go ahead and jump to the next part. So we're gonna do a few things. One, we're going to finally get into working with scales in ggplot. So if you notice on this plot, the values for uh, personality type of cunning goes from 0 to 100. For altruistic, it cuts it off kind of right above, I don't know, like around 85. Um, if we wanted to like have like a fair comparison, one to one, we might want to adjust this. So the scale goes up to 100. So ggplot or plot nine right now is just adjusting it to your maximum value. But let's say you wanna expand the scale or shorten the scale. 
uh, we can do that with like scale y continuous or scale x continuous. So we're going to use a couple of tricks there. Um, the other thing that we're going to play around is using size and mapping it to one of our data points within the data frame instead of just uh, the size of five. And then we're going to be playing around with how you can adapt size ranges with another scale called scale size continuous. And then we're going to switch up these colors. Um, I'm not crazy about default colors. If they're fine with you, you can keep them. If you want to use other colors besides the ones that I've got listed here, feel free to use whatever palette generator or whatever colors um, that you want to use for this step. So we're going to set it up more or less the same way. ggplot data equals got mapping is equal to aes x is what did we say it was cunning say house oh. so now because we're mapping it to a different variable we're going to map it to a characteristic called genius uh, just to see how smart these characters are, you know, what that looks like in comparison to these other personality traits. Right now, within our data set, we have a variable called dunce, which is like the opposite of genius. I prefer to look at things through a more optimistic lens. So we're going to invert this variable name and just do 100 minus dunce, and that would, would give us our genius variable name. Um, so we'll do mapping. AES, and then let's do size is equal to 100 minus dunce. So essentially you're just creating a, a formula using a static number and your variable. All right, let's go ahead and run that before we, we go on to the scales part. So now when you run it, you'll notice that the legend does two things. It splits it out. So now you have a legend pertaining to size because we've mapped it to a variable in our data set. And now you have a legend pertaining to your fill um, variable, which is your house. So the next part of this, we want to adjust our scale. So we have it going from um, zero to 100 for altruistic instead of cutting off. We want to have all of those breaks available. So the way that we can do this is by implementing scales. So you're gonna say scale underscore y underscore continuous. Uh, there's different tricks for different types of scales. There's like scale y discrete. There's a bunch of that in the documentation, but for now, all you need to do is use continuous. And then we can plug in um, our parameters for limits, which is gonna be stored in another list where we're gonna specify what's the lower bound and what's the upper bound. So here we're gonna say zero, and then the top upper limit is going to be 100. So now when you run that, it's going to change your, your scale. So this is a nice trick, for instance, if you want to if you want to eliminate some data and shorten the scale, you can. If you want to create a bigger range, you can do this here. There's also other tricks within scale continuous where you can specify the specific break labels and another list. Uh, but for right now, we're just going to keep it as as. OK. All right, next step that we're gonna go through is changing up the fill colors. Uh, what we can do here is we're gonna, we're gonna use scale again to alter the fill or the palette for our fill colors. So the way that we could do this, is we're gonna say scale underscore fill. If you've got auto things, you'll, you'll see that there's a couple of different mappings that you can use. Like there's, there's one specific for continuous variables, if you're familiar with Brewer, you could use scale fill Brewer. But if you want to go totally custom, what I like using is scale fill manual. And then in this step, what you can do is you can plug in values, either hex values, et cetera, in a list. So I'm going to go ahead and copy paste the values from above. Now, if I try to run this, it's going to spit out an error. It's going to say invalid RGBA argument NAN. And if I go back to what this plot has in the very beginning, there's a specific reason for that. So if you notice on your fill colors, you have one variable um, NA that doesn't pertain to any house. So in this instance, you not only have to tell 
the scale, what are the values you're plugging in for the actual houses? So we've got five of them, but you need to add one specifically for NA. And the way that you can do that is do NA value. And you could say gray. I always think gray is like the intuitive default NA value color. Oh. What did I it's do just here? the plus that is sorry. It's just the plus ah. that is missing. The typical things Cosima. that have more work to do plot. Cosima saves the day again. Perfect. All right. So now our colors have changed. This is going to map it in uh, the same order, alphabetical order of the house. So this is our red color, yellow color, etc. Uh, one other trick that we can do for our size, for instance, if you want to make the dots bigger or smaller and give it a new range, we can also use scale size continuous. Um, give me just a second here. So here we're going to say plug in. This is really just to, to deliberately play around with scales in this example. Scale size, and we're going to use continuous. And now to change the different um, limits of the size parameters, we're going to plug in an argument called range. And we're going to say the minimum size of this is going to be around four for our, our smallest dots. And for our biggest dots, it's going to be a size point value of around 12. Now you can see that the dots have gotten considerably bigger. And you can, you can play around with this however you want. Uh, I'm also going to keep our theme here with figure size. All right, a couple of last minute tricks before we move on to the next step. So if you're, if you're like me and you're looking at this legend, I think there's a lot of room for improvement with our legend here on the side. One is the dots are really small here. I can't really read what's, what's Baratheon or Greyjoy. I wanna increase the size of those dots in the legend. Uh, I want to perhaps change the look and feel of the size legend as well. And there's ways that we can modify our legend with a different part within ggplot called guides. So we're going to go ahead and work with guides. And I would say this is like really advanced stuff. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, don't, don't worry. I did not learn about guides until way later in my ggplot phase. But this is a cool way to like make those last minute tweaks here. So for guides, we're now going to specify the arguments of what we're tweaking. So for instance, for our fill legend, we can alter that by saying fill is equal to, I love how the parameters kind of automatically pop up. So guide color bar is really good if you're working with color bar legends, but since we're working with a plain one, you can just say guide, guide underscore legend. And now we have an argument in here called override underscore AES. So this is essentially saying, go ahead and override the aesthetic value of your legend. And we're gonna be playing around with size on this. And in Python, the way that we're gonna pass in those arguments specific to override AES, because you could override the size, you could override the color, the fill, uh, we're gonna pass it in as a dictionary. So here you're gonna say size, colon, let's try out five. Now you can see the, the dots have increased, right? All right, let's try this out one more time with our size legend. So if we wanna override that, we'll do something similar here where we'll say size is equal to, and we'll keep guide legend. We'll use the same trick of override AES. And let's say I just wanna make it a standalone circle with like an outline and, and like a white fill. So we're going to use our dictionary here. We're going to say color colon black. And then you can say fill colon white. Now that changes the look and feel of your size legend. A couple of other things that I've done to, to tweak this a little bit. Um, let's say because there's different overlapping bubbles here, you might want to use some opacity trick here. So if you want to make them a little more opaque or transparent, uh, you can use 
an alpha argument. So we're going to set it to a static value. So in, in your geom point layer, go ahead and add alpha is equal to 0 0.6. And let's go ahead and add color is equal to white. All right, getting there. Slowly but surely getting there. Okay, a couple of additional tweaks. So let's play around with adjusting the plot um, background and the grid lines. We'll do this, this one together. So go ahead and say, Panel dot background, and since we're working with borders or backgrounds, we're going to be using element rect, and then set fill to white. And then one more edit here. We're going to play around with our grid lines. The way that we can play around with adjusting our grid lines for everything, uh, you're going to say panel underscore grid. Notice that it gives you options to edit and adjust individual grid lines for specific ones like the major x grid line or y or just all of them uh, but we're going to go ahead and just tweak all of them and just say element line let's do fill is gray we can edit the size we can even edit the opacity of the line a lot of different things that you can do in themes and then my favorite part is just editing the text. So let's do element text. All right, a lot of typing. Let's see, let's see what this output looks like. Uh, let's see, where did I go wrong? Family. Let me go ahead and delete a couple of things. Okay, sorry folks. See, so it goes to show it doesn't matter how many times you GG plot, even people like me make mistakes. Panel underscore grid. Let's do element line again. Color is gray. All right, I'm gonna do this one by one. Looks better. You want to specify the thickness of the line, you can do that with size. And then last but not least, let's go ahead and change the font family with text and element text. All right, looks a little bit better. If you don't love the gray background of your legends, there's also another trick and theme to do that, or you can just say, um, you can say legend underscore key and do element blank. And there's there's endless different styling opportunities and themes. I'm just giving you a flavor of what you could do. So you could remove all of that. And then last but not least, you can also add your titles for things. So you could say title, Game of Thrones, personality matrix, X is altruistic. I really hope everybody's typing ability is better than mine today. X is equal to cunning. And I think we should be cut. All right, and that's how you would do a, a basic kind of pretty up version of a, of a scatter plot. There's a couple of other tricks that you can use here. I have this set up and already coded. If you want to preview it, go ahead and run. So this is adding a couple of things. I'd say like 90% of what we've done is already here. The only key difference is, is that um, I've layered it with some annotations with labels on the different ends of our, um, of our scales. If you wanna add like lines that cut across an entire X axis or Y axis, there's a couple of different geoms you can play with called geom H line or geom B line where you can set the intercept values. Um, the other, Thing that I've added here is some like specific callouts for characters. This is a good example of how you could layer different data sets uh, within your ggplot so you don't have to map everything to one data frame. You can also plug in a complementary data frame and use that. 
So there's an example of this here in um, this example, if you want to see how that's done. But overall, these are all of the tricks that we've done in, in the past uh, 15 minutes for our scatter plot. And that concludes plot two. So I'm going to open it up again for another round of questions. Uh, give folks a chance to refill their happy hour cocktail and take a break too if you need. But uh, I think Cosima, I think you're helping us out with Q&A for this part. Yes, yes, that's me. You actually explained everything so nicely that no one seems to have any questions. So I just thought we could like appreciate the beauty of, of your plots. And I really like how you explained the guides part. I mean, I have to admit, this is when it comes to ggplot, the part where I always start Googling and end up at Stack, Over Stack Overflow and just copy paste the parts that I need and kind of fill up my guides in a way that I need them. And it's beauty. It's, it's really nice seeing like, um, like how you can do things, right? And how easily it can also be done in Python. And not like getting down the rabbit hole of matplotlib and seaborn and all these, like coming from an R background, weird things. Like if oh, you, it's yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Like I was just like adding adding another question just out of interest. But go ahead. I'll ask in a bit. No, I, I listen. There is no shame in googling. I can't tell you how many times I've gone on ggplot's documentation to look at certain things. I forget how to tweak things, so there's never any shame in doing that. Um, there might be some like grand master GG plotters who do everything by heart and, and know all of the arguments, but there's just so much to it. It's hard to memorize them all. And for anybody who wants to take a look at all of the different options out there, there's some links in this notebook to, to explore. So don't don't feel overwhelmed. It's it, I'm always learning something new. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true that's so true it's just out of curiosity like um because i remember when i participated in the tidy tuesdays i always had some kind of a vision of, of a plot in my mind that i wanted to create because like tidy tuesday for me is like creating art and with art you kind of have something in mind that you somehow want to create right but when it comes to like plotting in in science like when I did it for my academic research, it always was more like I started off and then I added here some parts and there's some parts and I didn't have this kind of vision in mind. And I was just wondering, like, how is it for you? Do you start off with something that, oh, I want to have this kind of um, like access um, setting as you have it here with the personalities and with the with the dots in between? Or do you start like start off um and just see how the plot looks and then kind of custom stuff and, and choose different geoms and just see what fits. I mean, it's a tricky question, right? Probably I, there's no a really, clear cut it's a, answer. It's a, really, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think there is, everybody has their own process, right? Of, of how to plot or approach data visualization. And I think it, it depends what you're doing. Like sometimes if it's more exploratory in nature, like you don't know what the story is yet. Right. And then sometimes when you have the story figured out, it's like, oh, I know exactly what I want to do to convey the message. Um, you know, I'll admit, like, I don't put this much lipstick on my plots when I'm doing exploratory data viz. Sometimes it's just like quick and dirty. And then I'm like, oh, I see this cool trend here. What if we what if we did something like that? But, you know, I, I wouldn't say like I've got a clear defined process, but sometimes it's just like, you got to look at the data and figure out what the story is first before figuring out the right visual medium to convey it, if, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely no. Like, I mean, and there, like, for someone who's interested, there are also like super interesting videos out there on YouTube when people kind of video record the process of making plots. And you can see them starting off with like whatever dot plot or something like that and ending up with a violin plot or something like that. And like seeing how, how the thought process evolves. No, I think um, like I'm just checking the chat if there are any any other questions? Um, oh yeah, there's a there's there's one, and that's also one that I had in mind because with the GG plot, you always have these themes like the predefined themes, minimal theme, minimal theme, classic theme, mm -hmm. BW, something like that. Do you know something like this exists also for plot nine? It does. So, oh. and this is like a little bit further up in the notebook. So, if you want to look at some out of the box themes, I'm doing a little bit of scrolling here. 
but um, let me open this up. So here's some out of the box themes that they have in the API documentation. So there's some really similar ones that you'll notice like theme, here, let me zoom in, font is probably really small, like theme BW, theme classic, they've got a lot of the similar ones. And then you got to appreciate that they included theme Seaborn. So if you want to have like the look and feel of a Seaborn plot, you could definitely use this one. Um, but there's a couple of different ones in here that you could use. Look, theme so Matplotlib. Cool. So if, you were, if you're really married to Matplotlib, you could still stick with the theme from Matplotlib. This kind of reminds me so much about the, isn't there something like an Excel theme with ggplot? Like, I mean, you're making the most beautiful plot and then just put Excel on top as an additional layer. <laughs> why, why would you do that to yourself? I don't know. Or no, if, you, if you love the orange and blue default colors, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, that's cool. I think like um, just checking the chat again, but I think like you did an excellent job. Like no one has questions and we still have everyone on board. So congrats to you. Perfect. I'm going to trust everyone is awake behind their cameras right now. I've got no idea. People could be, you know, taking a nap or, or something else. Um, but it has been a pleasure kind of running through these plots with everyone today. We've got one last one. This one will be really quick, but I tried to save like the best for last, or in my opinion, the most wow factor for ggplot is going to be in this next step. Uh, and we're going to explore density plots and faceting. So what is faceting? Uh, I don't know if you've, if anyone's ever been in the scenario where you create a plot and you're like, well, now I want to create a plot for all of these different variables to see more or less the same thing. I think in Python, you could probably achieve this with something to the equivalent of a for loop where you, you say, here's my for loop and then continue to create all of these plots. With ggplot, what I really like is that I can do this with one line of code. I can essentially pivot my plot using a facet wrap and I can say, create the same plot for this variable looking at the same components. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and try out our first facet wrap together today. I, uh, since I can't get enough of friends, I had to make a reference here to friends with the pivot scene. If anybody watches, hopefully that's familiar. Um, but let's go ahead and get and get uh, started. So unlike our other da uh, data sets, instead of using the pivoted data, since plot nine is going to pivot it for us, we can go ahead and use that subset data set. So just a quick refresher of what that looked like. I hope I'm not giving folks whiplash here by like scrolling too fast. All right, so going back to our data set here, you'll notice that all of the questions are laid out here per, per character. So that is our, our subset. It's no longer stored as column values. You've got the values stored in independent rows. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna pivot on that personality type or our new um, outcome type of what we split it out to be. So let's go back down here. Okay. We're gonna do this. We're gonna look essentially at the distribution of all the ratings for all the characters across these, um, these questions based on, why, why am I blanking out here? Based, based on, it's gonna be a distribution or a density plot to, to visualize all of them together. So we're gonna go ahead, start off the same way we've been plotting all of our plots so far. You're gonna plug in ggplot. And then you're gonna say data is equal to subset. And now for our mapping, we're going to say x is equal to uh, rating because we've we've created a new rating component. All right. So we don't have to plug in y because you're creating a density plot. So all you have to do is is plug in your x variable. And the next line of code that we're going to do is say geom density. So that's going to give us like the nice bell curve or skewed graphs here with geom density. And then we're going to plug one more line of code called facet wrap. And within facet wrap, we're going to map it to, we've labeled this as outcome one with our string split. It's probably a more intuitive way of labeling this in re retrospect, but trust me on this one. So go ahead and map it to outcome one and then hit run. Oh, just a moment here. Oh, you know what it is, folks. I can do this a thousand times, but I've missed AES. So mapping is equal to AES and then parentheses rating. So 
So now essentially what it's done is it has created this density plot across all of those different features. We want to pretty this up a little bit. We can add, for instance, a fill mapping. So we could say fill is equal to outcome one. Uh, a couple of tricks here since we're mapping the color directly to it, to each facet, it's a little bit redundant to have a legend. So in these instances, there's a couple of ways that you can remove legends. One of them is just by using employing themes. So you could say theme legend underscore position. And for this one, instead of using an element function, it requires a string. So you could use like bottom, top, left or right. I will note with plot nine, I've noticed some funkiness when you try to move the legend to the bottom, it kind of skews it a little bit. So it's not perfect. Uh, but for this instance, if you want to just remove the legend, you can just type in none and it removes it entirely. And then you, you can feel free to add in some additional tweaks that we've done in the past by altering the figure size, altering the text. Actually, because this is a little more square, we can alter the figure size. So it's a little, a little more square, eight and eight. And then let's add in some of our titles. So we'll do labs, title, and let's call it distribution of characteristic ratings. And then for X, you can say average rating out of 100. If you don't like the black line on top of the plot, you can also set the color value to the same thing. Color is equal to outcome one. And because we've set legend is equal to none, it'll remove both of those uh, guides for us in the legend. And voila, that is our basic facet. If you wanted to explore some of those, uh, some of those themes we discussed earlier, you could completely either remove the theme and try out like theme Seaborn and see how that looks. Kind of gives you a similar look and feel. Um, if you want to continue to expand on themes, you can, you can even layer themes together. So you could still use theme Seaborn and then add your custom theme on top of it. So it's only gonna override the elements that you're changing. So now it's kind of like a mesh between theme Seaborn and some of the other things that you've described. Um, I have no clue what theme matplotlib looks like. I don't think I've tried this one. Just removes the access grids. I'm not crazy about this look, so I'm just gonna stick with theme Seaborn. All right. And this one was quick and sweet, but honestly, I think this one's probably the coolest trick of them all with facet wraps. There's so much that you can do with it. Uh, so you can imagine my excitement when I found plot nine in Python because I was able to create many plots in one go using facet wrap. Um, and that pretty much concludes our workshop for today. Before we do that, I'm gonna open it up again to Q and A. I have one challenge for folks on the call. Uh, this is just the beginning. This is this is not the end, right? There's so many fun things that you can do with Plot9 outside of this. So I encourage everyone to try to build their own Plot9 plot. Uh, you can use this data set. You can use whatever data set you want. And there's a bunch of stuff that you can learn just through the documentation out there. But thank you all. This has been a blast for me. I've had so much fun. I hope. Uh, this was just as exciting for other folks. I know you're joining us on like a Friday evening if you're if you're on uh, the European side of things or good morning to those folks joining us now. But this has been an awesome way for me to close out the week with you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Tanya. That was really wonderful. I have learned a lot from you today. And yeah, you like 
you went amazingly through uh, every plot and that was amazing. So I don't know if you fall, yeah, let me check the chat. If you fall has, have still questions, please don't. Yeah, I can see nice feedback on the chat. Um, thank you all for attending. So last thing, let me share with you my screen. Thank you all for attending. Okay, so. Um, you have a fun thing to suggest to you. So uh, I invite you to use Plot9 uh, on your own and like create plots using the Plot9 library. And uh, you highly encourage you to share uh, with us on Twitter using this hashtag, our Plot9. So we'd be happy to share to, to see about what you'd be creating after, after attending this workshop. So please uh, keep on your mind about this hashtag and you'll be waiting for your beautiful visuals. Um, as Ozima mentioned in the chat, so uh, we'll have uh, uh, we'll have the chance to have Tanya. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll have the chance to have Tanya um, again on October 13 with an Our Lady Sparse community, uh, and uh, this will be an opportunity to dive more in how creating uh, charts using Jujuplot 2. So the meetup is not yet shared on our meetup group. We will be notified later uh, about that. And also we'll make sure to share with you the recording video of uh, today's meetup. Uh, thank you all uh, for your attention and for attending our workshop. I don't know if Cosima or Amal, you would like to add something else. I don't have anything to add. I'm just like amazed. I'm happy. It was a fantastic workshop. And I told you, you're a database queen and you're a bilingual. So it's even more than just a database queen. No, thanks so <laughs> much for joining us. Yeah, thank, thank you for you. having me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Goodbye. You too.